here with us now joining the table along with Maria Bartiroma and Mark Halperin, Time Magazine's Rick Stenkel, who's here to unveil the latest cover of Time Magazine. And in Washington, we have MSNBC Chief Washington Correspondent Nora O'Donnell joining us as well. She's going to be talking about Sarah Palin's new book and what's in all it. All right. Thank you all so much for being with us. Top of the hour, a lot to talk about. Let's start with Afghanistan. Mika, the president, had a lot of options on the table. Yes. He'd been accused of dithering, taking too long. The president, though, uh, looked at all the options and said, I need to take a little bit longer. Yes, he did. Making no decisions. Yes, he did. And it's interesting. I, you and I have two very different views on this. I think that was actually a really, really good answer, given the fact that he wants to not pursue an open-ended commitment. And therefore, all the options on the table were not acceptable. Rick Stingle, uh, Mark Halpern, and I disagree respectfully with Mika Brzezinski. Mm -hmm. We believe, while the president is not dithering, um, maybe he's jumped the shark. Maybe he's taking just a little bit too long. I have to say, forget even the merits of the decision, I can't understand why they're playing it this way and, and measuring it out as though it's a play, a dramatic play in four or five acts for the American public so people can say, why isn't he making a decision about this? Why are they even releasing all this information? So there's a lot that I don't think we understand about this. I, I hope I hope they understand what they're doing, but it's a very odd strategy uh, to me. Can I challenge that and just say that probably the most difficult outcome here in terms of a decision for this administration would be to find an, a solution that is not open-ended? Uh, absolutely. The but what they, I'm all, only saying that they've set the time clock on themselves. They've turned over the hourglass and said, hey, we're, we have to make this decision in a certain amount of time. They don't. They can all do it all behind closed doors. Nobody was clamoring for them to make a decision until they set the time clock on themselves. And I guess that's the thing, Mark Halpern. We, we hear finally the president's going to make a decision. They announce this, and then they don't make another decision. Right. Well, Rick's metaphor is great because it is that turning over the hourglass, letting the country and the press know where the president's got this under consideration, this series of meetings. No matter how powerful a president is, even at the peak of power, there are two forces in Washington you cannot take on because they're not afraid of the White House. One is the CIA, and the other is the military. If the military is unhappy with the White House, they will, they will leak, they will, they will do what they need to to play their cards. And I think he's up against that right now. Yeah, the military the wants a decision. Exactly. The problem is, is that the military is looking for direction. Yeah. Maria, let, let me show you the front page of the New York Times. We've been talking about it this morning. Mika, tell us about the story. It's the Bachman family, one of many across America, unemployed, living on unemployment benefits, and the family taking a serious toll from the stress that their situation has them. The kids having trouble, one pulling their hair out, lots of different issues coming to the table. Difficulty and, across this country. And Maria, again, you've got, I, I just wonder whether you have a, not just the White House, but Washington, D.C., disconnected from where most Americans are. We're debating Afghanistan. We're debating health care reform. We're debating abortion within health care reform. But most Americans are concerned about their jobs. Right, and there are also projections in place that are forecasting very strong growth in the coming years, which many people are questioning whether or not that actually will materialize. So I, I think it's fair to say that most people feel that this recovery is fragile, mm. that we're still in a very slow state as far as economic growth, despite the fact that we did see 3.5% GDP the last, uh, the last report. But we need to see job creation. And it's very hard to measure the we created X number of jobs or, or we saved X number of jobs when you've got more than 10% of the country unemployed. That is not yeah. measurable, save or well, create it's jobs. It's not measurable. What is measurable, though, is this White House said. And I'm only saying this because it's going to come back in the next election. If you pass a stimulus program, unemployment's going to stay below 9%. It's not. You look at a poll that just uh, Gallup put out. Mm -hmm. It's what's Mark Halpern. It's called the generic ballot test. Of course, we know about it. It's it's it's, it's macro at best. Right but what does it tell you? Forty eight percent of Americans say they would vote for a Republican right now for Congress. Forty four percent say Democratic. That's a shift. It says the Republican brand is not broken completely, and that even without the solid specific ideas, the, the president's the questions about the president and his party's ability to handle the problems, particularly jobs, 
those questions are leading people to be open to the Republican Party, more than open, according to this poll. And that's a danger sign for the White House. They know it. They've got to get off health care in Afghanistan and on to jobs. All right. That's Not only goal. that, but there's we this class warfare going on. And even if you ask people in the administration, what is it going to take to get the economy uh, on you know traction again in terms of the recovery? They're going to say, we need businesses to hire workers. We need job creation from small business. And yet you don't have any incentives in place to actually get those companies to create jobs. And we need incentives, not tax increases. And Mika, it's the worst of all worlds for the White House because you've got businesses believing that the president's being a populist and being reckless, and you've got his own base thinking he's not going far enough and being hard enough on Wall Street. Exactly, and this happens on a number of different issues. We're going to get to uh, Nora O'Donnell in just a minute on Sarah Palin, but right now we want to turn to Rick Stengel, who's going to reveal the cover of Time magazine, which involves one of the other big stories this week. Yes, it does. It's, it's, a, it's a story about why uh, Major Hassan is a terrorist, and even though it has been played in the media from the moment of wow. the of the Fort Hood massacre as a kind of workplace killing by a lone crazy everybody if you connect the dots basically it was a kind of new kind of terrorism a kind of self-generated act of terrorism and I think we need to address this issue I mean there there were incredible red blinking lights all over the place for the FBI and the army and nobody actually connected the dots on this we've, we've avoided talking about it in a realistic hard way Wow! you know this is a man who uh, had been corresponding with a radical Islamic cleric in Yemen, a man who stood up before he killed people and said, God is great, in Arabic. All of these things, we're, trying to, we're, we're sort of denying the fact that he actually was a terrorist, but a new kind of terrorist. And we have people who still say we shouldn't look at the fact that he's a Muslim. But it seems to me we have to because that's this story, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think, I think you know, the FBI, I think the Army... You know, what, ha what was the lesson we learned after 9-11 is, is that people didn't connect the dots, that the information was out there. This was a preventable tragedy. There's mm. no doubt about it. There were incredible warning signs for years. Let me ask you a question, though, because... It's a great um, story by Nancy great, Gibbs, by the way. It is a, yeah. a fascinating conversation and one we need to have. Um, on both levels, the media and the federal authorities not connecting the dots. I just want to know what your thoughts are on the coverage and the day after and the conversations that were generated out of this because there was one place where we kind of cut through the BS and said, you know what, this looks like it's politically motivated. There is nothing saying post-traumatic stress, nothing saying mental illness, nothing well, saying repeat torture yeah. abuse, and that was right here. And Jack Jacobs, but we were actually, very much alone. Everybody was afraid to talk about it. Jack Jacobs on the ground said this is politically motivated. Bottom and everybody, line, everybody around here is sort of gassed. <gasps> no, no, and we have well, and we have great reporting in this piece, by, which is beautifully, beautifully written by Nancy Gibbs. But people in the military saying there's a lot of political correctness here. There's a lot of fear That's of criticizing Muslims in the military and as a result a guy like Hassan could get promoted up the ranks he became a major uh, and that basically they were ignoring these signals in the interest of political correctness Ooh. hey Rick help me out here who's the best college president in America uh, well we have Gordon Gee as the uh, best college president in America There's a great profile of him by uh, David Von Draley. we rank uh, where, where is he at uh, in uh, Ohio okay and um, and it's a new thing that we're doing. We're ranking college presidents. We're trying it out for the first time this year. And um, you know, I saw you had Arne Duncan on there. I mean, I mean, part of the motivation for us here is higher education has to be rethought in America. Time also talks about what we can learn from China. What can we learn? What we can learn from China is is to be ambitious, uh, to save money, uh, to build your infrastructure and to have a grand vision once again like we once had. I mean, China is doing the kinds of things that America was doing in the 19th century and the early 20th century. We have to get back to growth again. And my weekly Joe Klein <laughs> question. What jo what's Joe and, you know, Mar you saw and Mark Halpern's piece on Sarah Palin, by the way. Not that I want to ignore Joe Klein. Well, we were going to say... Well, Joe Klein, is ta is, it talks about Afghanistan. It, was, it really dovetails perfectly with what you were talking about this morning. He's basically saying, can the counterinsurgency strategy work in Afghanistan the way it worked in Iraq? And and basically, the conclusion is Iraq and Afghanistan are so different. There was a basis for it in, in Iraq in a way that there really isn't in Afghanistan, where so many of the generals say, look, it is a society that, that has no infrastructure, that has a broken political system, that is not sophisticated in the way that Iraq is. A counterinsurgency strategy might not actually work. 